here in America, there's probably no issue that generates more controversy than guns. This debate over guns in our society stems all the way back to 1791, when the Bill of Rights was ratified. These amendments now make up the foundation of our constitutional republic. And perhaps the most contentious of them all is the second, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. These 27 words have fundamentally changed the way we look at violence, protection, and civic responsibility. With the great power that guns wield, reports like these have become all too common. A gunman opened fire inside a movie theater in Denver, killing 12 people and wounding more than 50 others. The massacre at a Colorado movie theater, and just days later, a gunman opens fire at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin. Both cases tragic, unsuspected, and unthinkable. It's being called the worst mass killing at a school in American history. My youngest son was in Sandy Hook school. She said, Mommy, I can't get that body out of my head. I keep seeing it. Two 10-year-old children have been wounded during a shooting at a Mother's Day parade in New Orleans. Gunshots rang out this morning at the U.S. Navy Yard in Washington, D.C., killing several people and injuring many others. We have 12 fatalities, including the shooter. Seeing somebody die in front of you here where you work at is more of a relationship of you talking to God or you realizing just how fragile life is. We begin with breaking news out of Los Angeles International Airport. TSA officer, an employee of theirs, was killed by the gunman. According to airport police here, they chased down the gunman, eventually shot him, and took him into custody. Good evening and welcome to Guns in Our Town, a very special debate that will explore an issue that affects us all, the role of guns in American society. I'm Abby Martin, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's debate. The panel joining me now live is investigative journalist Ben Swan, director of New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, Leah Gunn Barrett, former NRA lobbyist and president of the Independent Firearms Association, Richard Feldman, and former presidential candidate for the Green Party, Jill Stein. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Before I begin, I want to explain what we're trying to achieve here. Guns are not a black and white issue, and we're not trying to emulate the corporate media's sensationalist coverage of the topic. This is going to be a rational, fact-based debate in an attempt to help bridge the divide between the many differing viewpoints there are on guns. All of you to start off, we'll have one minute to answer the first question, followed by another minute to follow up, and then I'm going to open it up to a totally free-form discussion where any of you are able to jump in at any point. So without further ado, let's take a look at some statistics from last year. America's unique in that there are 89 guns for every 100 people, placing the U.S. at a solid number one in the world in guns per capita. For perspective, the number two country is Yemen, with about 55 guns per 100 people. Now let's take a look at just the developed world, specifically with regards to gun-related murders. The U.S. sits well above the rest, with about 3.3 to 3.6 homicides by firearm per 100,000 people. Finally, according to Slate.com, there have been approximately 11,435 gun-related homicides since the Newtown shooting. Not to mention today's shooting at a high school in Centennial, Colorado, where two students were injured. The gunman is reported dead. Ben, let's start with you. What do you think the root cause of this gun violence is? Well, I think that we have uh, a very complex issue here. And I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this on your show, Abby, because as you said, we, we need to have a rational debate about this issue in this country, and we don't have one. Uh, we have a lot of headlines and very little detail behind it. So look, um, there are a number of things that I think you can look at in terms of uh, violence increasing across the United States, in terms of gun violence across the U.S. But statistically, violent crime in the United States has actually been declining for the past 50 years. And you would never know that watching most mainstream media. What they would have you believe is that we're becoming more and more violent as a society and more people are dying uh, through violent crime than ever before. And that's really not true. The reality is this, that there are a number of reasons why I believe uh, we are seeing um, some of these high-profile cases and certainly some of the mass shootings, and those grab headlines, um, but they don't necessarily have a more important um, distinction than the individual who shot. So, you know, while media makes a big deal out of a school shooting, on one hand, they'll all but ignore 
the mass violence in a city like Chicago, where you have drive-bys and uh, gang violence, a lot of it going back to uh, the drug culture and the prohibition of drugs in this country. And then there's also the issue of uh, folks who are taking some of these, these psychedelic drugs. You know, Alex Jones made a lot of, uh, uh, got a lot of attention when he referred to those mass murder suicide pills when he was on right. CNN recently or about a year ago. Uh, but there is some truth to what he was talking about. Moving on. Uh, thank you, Ben. Leah, on to you. Uh, what I think the problem is, well, first of all, um, the gun death rate in the United States has remained pretty high, consistently high. Crime, it's true, is down. The problem we have is there are so many guns in this country, and many guns are getting into the wrong hands. Our weak federal gun laws are not doing a very good job here. Uh, we don't have background checks, for example, on commercial sales of guns um, on the Internet. Uh, at gun sales or private sales. There are background checks at firearms dealers, FFLs as they're called, but that covers about 60% of all gun sales, leaving 40% um, basically uncovered. There's a big problem with uh, people getting guns and then traffic them, trafficking them into states like New York. Um, we don't traffic guns out of New York. Guns are trafficked into our state from places like Virginia and Georgia and Florida. So uh, we need to tighten up our federal gun laws. New York has very strong gun laws. A handful of states do. But guns don't know any boundaries. They go across boundaries quite easily. Uh, another problem that people haven't really mentioned is uh, well, role of we're, guns We're going to come back to that, Leah. We're going to move on to Richard okay. now. Go for it. Hello. You know, when we look at this whole issue, it's a very complicated issue, as Ben points out. And there are different aspects to the issue. There are three important subsets within the misuse of firearms. There's the intentional criminal misuse of guns. There's the negligent misuse of guns. And then there's the deranged shooter or the suicidal shooter. And there are different strategies that we need to focus on to address each one. And when we mix them up, as we have over the past year, and just talk about one from column A affecting one from column B, we end up with the food fight that was our legislative process in Washington last year. And I hope we can elucidate and shed some real light on this issue over the next hour. Thank you. Jill? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate what everyone has said. It's a very complicated problem. Uh, but that said, there's a lot we can do about it. And while uh, rates of violent crime and gun homicides have gone down over the last two decades, really. Um, they're still sky high compared to what they could be and what they should be. We have about 100 times the rate of gun homicides and violent gun crimes relative to many countries of Western Europe. And we should not be in the business of normalizing violence. Uh, and Related to that, I think it's clear there's a relationship between uh, gun violence and economic violence and poverty and uh, racial disparities and economic disparities and all that. And the more we become an unjust society, uh, you know, the more we are at risk for continuing uh, gun violence and potentially growing gun violence. And one last point is that. You know, the American people have wanted to do something about this. We yeah. have about 90% support, but we I'm have, have really there, a Jill. political, I'll just say we've got a political problem that prevents us from fixing this in the way that the American people would like. Ben, do you have a response? Well, look, I, and I, I totally agree uh, with what Jill just said about not normalizing the violence. I think that's a very important point. But look, when we talk about politicians, I would just make this point very quickly that Politicians want to jump on the issue of guns because it's a very political issue. And as you pointed out in the beginning, Abby, it's an issue that people are very divided on. So while you get people who are passionately for it and people who are passionately against it, at least you're deriving passions as a politician. But if politicians were sincere about a lot of this, you know, candidly, and not to take us off topic, but 10 times the number of kids have been killed in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen through drone strike uh, than were killed at Sandy Hook. And over the past, since 2007. And so when we see that happening and politicians silent on those issues, but then they, they rail against guns in the United States because we must protect the children, to me, when it comes to the political issue, it rings hollow because we see so much violence occurring around the world at the hands of government who then wants to be able to protect people at home by taking away guns. I think that's why there's such a disparity there because the, the talk and the walk don't always meet each other. Leah, do you have a response? 
Um, just to say that I think uh, gun violence in this country is certainly not helped by money in politics. I think uh, the vote you saw in the Senate last April uh, was because of intense lobbying by uh, the gun lobby, the corporate gun lobby, not just the National Rifle Association, but Gun Owners of America and a number of others. And they frightened politicians from doing the right thing. The politicians are more in the back pocket of the corporate gun lobby than in the interests of their constituents. So I think money in politics is a really big problem. But I think we're also looking at this issue probably through the wrong lens. I think we should look at it as a public health problem. When you have 31,000 Americans dying every year from guns and 80,000 being injured, that's a public health crisis. So you need to apply a different approach, which has been successfully done with, for example, automobiles and tobacco smoking. You look at the product, you look about how can you reduce death and injury from the product. And there are two ways you can do that. You can strengthen our laws federally and state through education, plus you can also make the product safer. And the gun industry has resisted any attempt to make their product safer. Smart gun technology is out there, but you're not seeing them investing in it. Uh, Richard? Well, you know, what Lee is missing in this is that other side of the whole issue, which is that there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times, perhaps upwards of two million, that citizens use guns to protect themselves and prevent a tragedy from happening. So it's not enough to just look at the tragedy that occurs, but look at the positive side. Uh, after all, if guns were so useless in self-defense, why do we issue them to America's law enforcement? It's because they are effective. When you speak about guns not being safe, well, they're very safe. Guns do exactly what they're promised to do. The issue is never the gun per se, but rather in whose hands are the guns. Jill, and do you think the issue of the gun is way. not is not the issue? Um, you know, I, I, th I think it's uh, it, it's complicated, and I guess I don't agree with Richard that guns make us safer in the same way, to Ben's point, that a more militarized foreign policy in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, spending $5 trillion over the past decade and, you know, uh, countless thousands of American and hundreds of thousands of uh, foreign lives, you know, that hasn't made us safer. A, a militarized foreign policy doesn't make us safer, and I think that armed encampment and arming our homes and the idea that arming our schools is going to make us safer, uh, you know, it tends to be the opposite, evidence would suggest. And there's not a single case in the 62 mass murders that have taken place over the last 30 years, the mass shootings, there's not a single case where someone with a gun has been able to intervene. Even when no, trained law enforcement is on the scene, it's I see, been very dangerous I see to Richard engage. wanting to respond. We're going to have to take one quick break. Richard, you guys, all great points made. Coming up, we'll have a report on Newtown one year after the massacre that left 28 people dead and explore what's been done politically since that fateful day. Stick around.